Father, we want to stay in the flow of what you're releasing, what you're doing, what you're saying here. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts and minds opened. <laughs> bring it, God. Just bring it. Whatever you got, bring it. Bring the fire. In the name of Jesus. Amen. How is everybody? You okay? There's like pollen gazoo out there, right? If there was a photography like South Carolina, it was like pollen cloud, like just massive. It's it's everywhere. So anyway, some of that's happening. I think I've shared this story with you before, but you're calling us deeper, deeper still, right? We started with that song. And that just came back again and again as I was working on, God, what is it you want me to do? What do you want to say this week? And hopefully this will work. Come on, we're having technical issues tonight. It's on. There we go. Okay, so a number of years ago out in California, a friend of mine, um, therapist, had uh, an older woman come in and they were talking and just getting introduced. And she said, well, you know, honey, there's something I think you should know. I've had five marriages. And at the time, my friend went, oh my goodness, what, what did you possibly do adjusting to each husband? And she said, oh no, you don't understand. I've only had one husband, but we've had five marriages. Hello, you do, do you get that? Okay. Kim and I got married, and at first we were just very independent. I was working at a great job. She was in school, also doing a job, and it was just two of us in this big house. That was kind of one marriage. And then at that point decided we needed to shift things. I quit my job, we put everything into storage, and we uh, put the house up for rent, because we weren't sure where we were going, and we went over to Europe and spent six months in a VW camper van, going to sleeping head to foot. That was marriage number two. It was almost a divorce. Almost a divorce. <laughs> it was close, okay? Then we came back, other things settled. We, we shifted over to Washington, D.C. We got settled in there. That was really marriage number three. Are you understanding? Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to go through different marriages because the challenge is somebody who wants to keep it just the way it was because it doesn't work that way. Okay, you're supposed to grow and deepen and it's supposed to change over time. Yeah, you good with that? Okay. Now that connects into this. We've talked about this before. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So there's a three part process that's involved in a healthy marriage of leave, cleave, and become one. But the reality is, just as you heard in that, you can't just do it one time. Okay, this is a process, a successful marriage. You're always figuring out what you got to leave. When we went from going to, we had, we had a four bedroom, three bath house, three car garage. The two of us were living in California. Okay, I was selling new homes out there. So it was kind of like, okay. And we went to a VW camper van. You had to leave a whole lot of things, okay? If you tried to bring the expectations of the space and everything else you had, it wasn't gonna happen. Now. It also happened inversely. After six months of being together, we were so accustomed to being together that when we had to go into the work world and do the other stuff, it was hard. Yeah? But we had to be able to leave that, move into the next thing. Say, leave, cleave, become one. Leave, cleave, become one. Okay, for many of you, I've talked about this. In fact, I took some counsel from Jeannie Leroy because I said, you know, I don't want to necessarily talk about this because I've talked about it before. And Jean said, no, we usually need to hear it again. So some of this is going to overlap, okay? So we'll keep going. And then i got to dovetail it with this. Have you ever heard this? Wow, I just love second grade or a particular year. And then I love this line, the comedic line. It was the best four years of my life. <laughs> there are people who go round and round and round the same thing again and again and God is going to let you do that for a period of time you will drive yourself and everybody else a little nuts right but the reality is it's the same thing like the five different marriages you've got to get what you need to get and go to the next stage yeah 
But we have fostered often in the church this same thing. Going around the same thing again, around the same thing again, around the same thing again. And we're not supposed to, right? We can all draw close to him with the veil removed from our faces. And with no veil, we all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus. We are being transfigured into his very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another. And this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Yeah? Amen? Amen. Okay. So the reality is, rather than just going through the same thing again, we are supposed to be transformed. And then because we're in a covenant relationship with the Lord, you have to be ready that the marriage you have with the Lord, the relationship with you have with the Lord, needs to move into another level. How many of you have had that? Yes. Right? And part of the challenge is, is when you had something that was really good, letting that go and letting the new thing become current. Oh, but it was so great when, you know, we had this. It was so great when Kim and I were just really that close and traveling around and we had this freedom, da 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 da, da. Okay, I can't, I can't just drag that forward and live in that. And some of you know people that live in that. Okay, there are fellowships, there are families, there are churches that live in that. Oh, remember the revival. And they're stuck there. Okay, what now? doesn't mean that God's left, but that's not what he's doing now. Okay, so I'm going to keep going here. The reason this is important, right, is because a week from Sunday, we're going to have Resurrection Sunday. Now, many people, most of the church, we won't get into this, but they call it Easter, right, which is actually named after, you know, a Roman goddess and yada, yada, yada. Anyway, but you end up having competition, and as a result, some of that begins to creep into what we do and how we do it, and sometimes with the best intents. For instance, this is a Baptist church doing one of the latest crazes. And do you know what this is? An egg drop. An egg drop with a helicopter. Oh, my gosh. oh yeah, these things, you could look, just Google it. Just Google it. And Everbright will give you all sorts of places where you could go, although most of them are sold out already. Now, this is a good Baptist church, and they're doing it as an outreach. And I, okay, I, you know, wouldn't personally be probably comfortable with that but you know what if, if that'll work but look at all the people here but it's an outreach event and you do it with a helicopter and I guess everybody anyway seems a little bit interesting but the reality is what's the focus going to be in this time in what's going on and then how has God aligned this so that we're going deeper deeper still because the reality is is that a lot of people don't understand the big three you guys do, but the big three feasts are Passover in the first month, Pentecost in the third month, and Tabernacles in the seventh. And God has set these up so that we rotate through them and is taking us deeper, deeper still so that we're not just wrapped around the time, but we actually get plugged in. I love this illustration. <laughs> this is actually a product you could buy, right? So you wrap the extension cord around there until you need it, and then you plug it in. This is what many of our lives look like. We're wrapped all the way around it, but we're never plugged into the core, right? So we're around the power, but none of it's moving through us. Okay? And we've got to become fully engaged so that we have all of him meeting all of us. Body, mind, soul, and spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, right? Whatever you got to do. You okay there? Okay. And the reason it's important is there's three different ways that you can end up kind of connecting in this time. You're supposed to remember, you're supposed to honor, but we need to move to full engagement. So remembering is good, honoring is necessary, but engagement is where you have to go in order to get the power plugged in. Because see, remembering tends to be about the past, right? You remember the past. So for a lot of places, they're remembering that Jesus died and was raised again. That's critical. We have to remember that. And for someone who's never heard that, doesn't know Jesus, hearing that word is absolutely pivotal. The reality is most of the people showing up to church, though, know that story, been there, okay, have received him, and they show up and they're remembering that. Okay. 
and it's not taking them deeper yet. And then if we move into honor, honor often has to do with the present. So you can just remember something, but when you properly honor it, you bring it more into the moment. You getting that? You're reflecting back on it, you're saying you're honor it. But to fully engage it means that it's, it becomes a current transaction. In some way, it's past, current, and future. Because see, when you engage, you've got to bring connecting with the past of what has happened already for you, through you, in you, by Jesus. You honor all of that. You say, oh Lord, I'm so grateful for how you've done it. But then you're looking to the future and how do you want to shift me more so that I'm going deeper and deeper still. Yeah? Yep. Okay. Just some of you know this is a little different way of connecting the dots. And then again, I pulled this from Robert Heiler, but I think the, the tabernacle, the court, translates this exactly. That the outer court is the sacrifice and the water cleansing. It really has to do with this first part about leaving. It has to do with Passover. It has to do with the sacrifice of the lamb and then going through the Red Sea or being baptized in the water. It is really a first snapshot about our salvation. And then you go to the inner courtyard where you have the sevenfold light representing the Holy Spirit, the prayers of the people, the provision of God. And then you're moving deeper and deeper now into the Holy of Holies where the mercy seat is. And so every year, Passover is like this first one, we're really honoring what Jesus did, what happened with Moses and the troop there. Pentecost is really about the provision of God through the Holy Spirit, that sevenfold light. And then Tabernacles is moving deeper and deeper into that area of the mercy seat. So every year, there's a process of going deeper into the next level. And each time, God wants to address something more. Yeah, you got this? Or the too fast. Many of you have seen this, but I just want to bring it up to you again. God is showing us each time. And there's things that are acceptable in the first outer courtyard that are not on the inner. Things on the inner that can't go into the Holy of Holies. Okay? And God has said, okay, I want you to deal with this part right now. I need you to understand what's going on here. There's certain things that you've got to leave outside that you can't bring in the courtyard. And certain things that have to be dealt with right here. Things that you've got to leave. One of the first is right is about your sin and all that garbage and all that crust that's following you along. We got to deal with that now. So there's a focus that comes back again. But it's not so that you stay stagnant because there's always a crossing over into the next. So the big three, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, and the relationship with the Lord is supposed to grow every year so we're not in second grade for four years. Well, it's another Easter pageant. <laughs> Right? Okay. And there's, I, I, I'm not, I need you to hear my heart. I know good comes out of that. I know people are touched. I know salvation's come. We need all of that. That is not my particular focus. Mine is to try to rally and support up the body of Jesus to grow up into maturity and advance in the kingdom. To multiply the multipliers. That's why we're a carrier. Not everybody can deal with being on a carrier, landing on a carrier, getting refueled, rearmed, and going out for your mission. You all, like Kim was saying, you all have a ministry. You all have an assignment. You all need to be rearmed to go out there. Okay, so then we come around again and we see the same thing is an ongoing process. You leave, you cleave in Pentecost, becoming one is tabernacles. And so God takes us through this process again and again and again. And each time right now, we're going to focus there a little bit more on the leaving because this is often what happens in a relationship. What do you call a no-maintenance marriage, by the way? Divorce. A divorce, yeah. <laughs> no-maintenance marriage, right? But often it will start with this, and I need you to think in terms of a marriage relationship, but then I need you to think about you and Jesus. Sometimes it just seems like, you know, I'm just so busy. I'm so distracted. You know, Kim and I, in our first marriage, frankly, we were married, and, but we were living almost separate lives because I was so consumed with work and she was school and everything else. And we had this big house and we had our own cars and just, and we didn't really know that because we thought we were fine. I mean, we even had separate checkbooks for the first year or so, right? Just because we were, okay, whatever. But then when we went over and lived in a VW camper van, let me tell you, suddenly it got very real, okay? Because you can't just ignore each other. 
right? You have to deal with that. But what happens often in any relationship is it can become just distracted and separated and unfortunately can go from there to there with outright hostility. You watch this with people who will come into the church on Resurrection Sunday to celebrate the Lord and there'll be even a little bit of heartwarming, but then they leave and there's more distance, more distance. And the challenge is, is that you'll ask that person, do you go to church somewhere? Oh yeah, I go to so-and-so. Now they're not telling you they only go twice a year, right? No. But then you're looking at their life going, okay, if he's going there, I don't, not see in the life, okay? So the challenge is what we reflect out then is not the passion, is not the deeper heart life with him. You tracking on this so far? Okay. And then I got to find one of a couple that are just together and hanging out and everything else, but I've got to deal with the Lion of Judah. So I'm going to use this picture again because this is the way that I think we're supposed to be. Okay. With the King and understanding there is a, there's a connection. He is Lord. He is master, but there's a playfulness and a tenderness and being able to be completely yourself. And that's that deeper water that he wants us to go into. You're calling us deeper, deeper still. But a lot of times we're just stuck on the shore because the reality is every crossover has a cross. Yeah? Okay. There's always something that's gotta die <laughs> to get over. Jim Shadrach, who, by the way, Jim and Helen are doing well. They're getting settled in. Helen's saying the whole living room still boxes, but you know how that is. So she's sorting that through and everything. Continue to pray for them. We've gotten their new phone number and address there so we can get that to you. But just keep them in prayer because that's moving stressful, especially when you haven't moved in 49 years. Okay. It's a little bit more process. But there's always things that have got to go, things that have got to be left. But let me show you this, because what's interesting in God's timing is that he aligns three events in the same window because he's trying to say something to us, okay? First is out in Egypt, which is basically a jailbreak, right? How many of you read the ping? Okay, good. Some of you going, okay, I'm not sure why I read that yet. Don't worry about it. But part of the first thing was to put you into that first crossing over when he gives instructions about the Passover meal, do you remember what it says? They're supposed to lounge around and what are they supposed to do? Be ready. Be ready. Okay. Staff in hand. Boots on, sandals on, and their cloak tucked in their belt. Okay. You are supposed to be ready to go because basically this is a jailbreak. Okay. He's been pounding and pounding and pounding away at all the gods that were around them, demonstrating to the Egyptians and to the Israelites his superiority. The plagues come. There's a death prep, right? There's a death that all oh, something. There's always a cross. There's something that has to die. And they are literally pushed out by Pharaoh and by God. And the crossover, basically, it's a person who leads them. Who is that? Yes. Moses. That's right person leads. He puts a staff in the water and that's how it goes over and they're moving from bondage to freedom. Okay, so one theme, right? But then you fast forward 40 years later and in the same time frame you've got Joshua crossing over with the Israelites into the promised land. Okay, you can't ignore this because we're, we're always good on this one for all the symbolism for Jesus and the crucifixion, resurrection, defeating Satan, and that's Pharaoh, you know, crossing through the Red Sea is like baptism and getting out and getting free, right? And the problem is then we get stuck out there in the wilderness. So God's make sure that he time stamps the second crossing, which is literally an invasion. And this is where most of the church hasn't made it, right? And where most times we get stuck because God says, I have a land, I have something I need you to occupy. And we just sit there and go, what? I'm saved, right? You, you work it out. That didn't work out so well for Israel, did it? Okay. A shortened journey became a longer journey. And talk about going around the same mountain. Second grade was the best 40 years of their life. Not really. It was the most miserable and they got to live it over and over and over again, right? Okay. 
the invasion comes. Now there's a time lag, right? And there are there's death involved. Who's got to die before they cross? Who? All of them except two. Whole generations got to go on a death march, basically, because there's something they got to leave behind. There was too much of Egypt that followed them into the wilderness, and it couldn't follow them into the promise. Okay. And so on this, but what's interesting now, they cross differently. Now the presence leads, right? Now it's not Joshua goes forward with the staff. It's the priests that go forward with the ark. It's the presence of the Lord. But they got to be willing to put their feet in the water before it shifts. Go back and look at the narrative, right? At the Red Sea, Moses stands there with the staff and the wind blows all night. Don't happen when they go to the Jordan. They got to go on the water. Different kind of crossing. And then they're moving, instead of from bondage to freedom, they're moving from the wanderings into the full promise. So question that's going to come up, where are the areas where there's bondage still for you? Where are the areas where there's just wandering around in confusion? This is the time to deal, let God deal with you about what's holding you back so you don't cross over. Because it's always something that's going to hold you back, right? How many times did Israel in the midst of any crisis say, oh, if we were only back in Egypt, weren't there enough graves? You know, in Egypt that you had to bring us out here. And that, uh, yeah, okay. And then the third thing is, of course, is with Jesus in Jerusalem. And it's very interesting because, again, there's this whole entrance that's going to happen now, right? It's on the 10th day of the month. That's the sheep selection day when Jesus is going to come into Jerusalem with the triumphal entry. And then the next thing he's going to go, he's going to go a little house cleaning, right, in the temple, making a whip. Okay. But I need you to see that there's something even in there that he has to leave. There's always something you have to leave. And what he has to leave there, I mean, think about this. Four days before he's going to be crucified, but that hasn't happened yet, he rides in as the hero king. You don't think he was tempted to go, this is good. Let's... Let's do this. Do you understand? You don't think that he was, he was tempted in every way that we are. You don't think that the, the respect or the reverence of men and women didn't draw on him? We know that he understands every temptation, but didn't give into it, right? Had to keep clear about, you know what? I'm not going to please them, and I'm not going to be worried about ticking off the rulers in the temple. I'm going to stand where I need to stand. And so he moves from life to death to life. It's just interesting that all three of these are anchored in the same frame because there's something that God has to say to each of us about how are we moving? What are the things we got to get out of? So let me ask you this. Was there an upside for Israel being in Egypt? What were the benefits that they had there that kind of would want to make them stay? Talk to me. No responsibility, right? Okay. It's kind of just show up. Leeks and garlic. Okay, leeks and garlic. They had a nice variety of food. It was available there, right? We don't think there was a quantity issue because, you know, they were right there on the Nile, so that's where a lot of things grew. What else? What are the benefits? Uh, other than them killing the sons, there was protection. There was protection, right? They didn't have to go to war. Right. Yeah. Egypt was a mighty nation, so there was a lot of protection being there. What else? Sameness? Yeah, nothing changed. Nothing changed, okay? It's very predictable. Really? Very predictable. Yeah, so might even say comfortable, right? Okay, work sucks, but you know what? A lot of you would say that, you know? Work sucks, but it's predictable. I can go and do this and get paid for it, and okay. Yeah? There is always a draw to what we have to leave, and God often has to make us uncomfortable in that before we'll do it. But if you think that it's just, is there, let me just jump ahead, right? Because you know that when you moved through faith in Jesus into salvation, you were supposed to leave your life of sin, right? How well has that worked for you? 
You clean and clear ever since that first day? Okay, there's this stuff, right, that, that has handholds and, you know, so there's always more leaving. Part of what Kim is helping people do constantly is to deal with that old stuff and leave. One of the biggest issues in any marriage, Kim and I spent a lot of years going to, to therapy. And people would look at us and go, wait, you're highly functional. Yeah, but we would tell them, look, we could have a lot more money later and just have a bigger divorce settlement. Or we could invest it now in the marriage. And that's what we did. And part of what he, they would do constantly with us was deal with our old stuff. In fact, almost every time I wanted to talk about something with Kim, he goes, no, let's talk about you. See, he was getting me free from that past. I gotta leave, I gotta leave, I gotta leave so I can cleave. And God is still doing that with us. He's getting us cleaned up so we can leave that stuff, get away from those hooks so that we're fully connected to him. Okay, so here, what they had. Well, they had work they could count on, right? I mean, it's dependable, okay? What else? They had food, they had water. That wasn't gonna be a problem. They had permanent habitations. In Goshen. In Goshen. Yeah, they got it. They had predictability and they had a level of security, right? Not having to do that. Lots of religions all around and so there was room for more. It was this multicultural thing. You want another God, okay. Right? Well, that's your God, okay. Well, this is my God. Sound similar to anything recently? Okay. They had a simple identity. This is who I am. I don't have to define myself. I do this. I make bricks. I come home. I got, you know, it was all organized. They had protection from war. And they had no big decisions. They just sort of showed up and keep your head down, right? You don't think that's very seductive over time? And the pounding with the plagues was in part, God was, if you go back and read the text, he was pushing Pharaoh so he would force them out. They were just catapulted, but he also needed to make it intense enough that they would want to leave. Remember, the first three plagues hit everybody. And then he started to separate it out. Okay, so when you do transition though, I love this picture, I thought it was kind of funny. This is an actual sign on the door. Keep back, this door is unpredictable. When we cross, you have to understand that so often we're leaving what was predictable and what was normal and what was whatever comfortable into something more. Did that happen with Israel? Absolutely. When you cross, your work may be all over the map. Guess what? What was their work when they went out in the wilderness? And where was it? Okay. Some of you are experiencing that. You're, wanting, you're leaving a predictability to, okay, what, where, how? Your habitation is always temporary once you've crossed. You get, blessed are those who've set their hearts on pilgrimage, yes. says the Psalms. Yes. Okay? We have a citizenship that is eternal. And so temporal, this is temporal, right? I'm going to get a new one that's not. Hallelujah. That'll be good. <laughs> okay. The predictability security in the natural is absolutely dynamic. You have predictability and security in the Lord and knowing that he is there, right? I will never leave you or forsake you. But it's very dynamic in the natural. <laughs> Hello? Okay. Your faith is light in darkness, okay? It becomes increasingly. They were in a place where their faith with their faith, it's like, okay, well, you don't want to bow to this, okay, but this one and this one and this one, right? Now it's very clear. Your identity shifts from being one of those to one of his. It's personal, it's specific, and it's risky. War is inevitable once you cross. Back there, yeah, you're kind of just in the security of things. New freedom and decisions, new responsibility because your decisions matter more. You tracking this? So. The deeper still, God's saying, I need you to grow up. Let's not do second grade again. And let's not do another year of marriage like we did the last one. How many of you want a better year of relationship with God than you had the year before? I mean, really. Not just, not just more connected, but also more fun. I'm serious. Because you got to get Jehovah sneaky. The more you're with him, the more he, he'll show you the whole range. And it'll just surprise you. Okay. So, am I saying too much? You catching this? Okay, that's one area of crossover. But now, the other one. What was the upside of being out in the wilderness? 
Talk to me. What was the upside of being out there? Closed Pardon me? They're closed, didn't rock. They're closed, didn't rock. Okay, that's wild, huh? Yeah, it says that all the time. Their clothes never wore out. What else? His presence. Sorry? His presence, the cloud. His presence, the cloud, the physical manifestation, presence of God with him all the time. How many of you would like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mike? What? They had food every day. What did they have? They had banana, banana bread and banana. banana waffles. and. They didn't have to they didn't have to cook. I don't know. Boiled manna, baked manna, manna chips, manna wafers. Say what? Quail? They had quail. They had quail. Then the quail came. Okay. What are the other upsides of being out there wandering around? They had the Sabbath. Okay, yeah, they didn't have the Sabbath in there. So now, hey, we got a day off. Cool. Although they didn't always do so well with that, did they? Oh, but we're used to working. Ah, Got to get it. Okay, what else? Other upsides? Changes and newness. Uh, Changes, okay, yeah, variety. You get to move here, move there. Move here, move there. Yeah, yeah, we're free spirits. Hey! It's cool. It's not boring anymore. It, no, no, it's not same old, same old. It's just got a lot of variety. Okay, let me just see what I put up here. What they had, they had minimal responsibility. What do you do? Well, I get up and I get the mana. <laughs> Then what do you do? Uh, we'll wait and see if the fire or the clouds moving. Okay, pretty low key, right? What else? Uh, they had predictability of food with the manna daily. They had limited conflicts in war. In the forty years, there were only three battles they fought out there. Okay. And one every one of them. Pardon me? They won each one. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we got conflicts, but they're not too often. There were no big decisions. Again, you just show up and move when he moves. Which is what a lot of us would really like to do, right? Okay. You move, I'll move. Have you moved? Okay. Sorry. And by the way, they were about three million strong, which meant there was minimal outside influence. They didn't have to worry about that cultural stuff from Egypt, right? Whacking away at them or sinking their weird because, hey, we're all alike right here. We're in this little cluster. This is good, and we can move around wherever we need to. Okay? So... But I like this guy because he looks confident like somebody's ready to step over. You see, those are all fine, but they're all seductive for keeping us in a, the one area where God has crossed us over and not moving into the next. Well, God, I don't really want that responsibility. It's easy just to kind of be... I, do you, did you like this picture of the camper, the Winnebago out there? I mean, that you know, let me tell you, I enjoyed that time when we were in the VW camper van. Sleeping, that was not such great, but the traveling around and the flexibility and not having a lot of the responsibilities was really nice. But you get here, whoops, I don't have to go all the way through that. Again. There we go. This guy knows when you cross over into the promise, now your responsibility is expanded. And a lot of times that's reason enough for us to not want to go, okay? And stay in second grade again. Your provision shifts. Do you remember when they go over there? When they have Passover? The manna stops. Well, now what do we got to do? But then they ate the other folks' stuff. I know, but they still got to go and harvest it. They got to do it. Yeah, and then they're going to have to start working the fields. You're in a war zone, and there are no non combatants. When God gets us out in the wilderness time and season, it's, it's, it's minimal on the warfare, I think. It really gets intense when you take in the land that he's assigned. Your decisions impact not only others, but the land you take. See, now it's not about just wandering around. It's about you are responsible for taking and cleaning up this turf. Now, let's keep in mind, put your hand here and say land. Land. Put your hand here and say land. land. This is the first land you are responsible for taking. Do you understand? You can't just be wandering around. We are responsible to take dominion over this. Okay? By being connected with God. Crossing over to what's deeper. And you know it's a whole lot easier to go, well I'm just saved. I'm just kind of wandering around. God's like, okay wait a minute. You are not in second grade again. This is not first year marriage gagas. You, you've got to get deeper still. Right? 
Okay, let's keep going. Your interdependence upon others increases because there's a warfare <laughs> dynamic. And now if, you know, out in the wilderness is pretty good because, you know, Joe over here snores too bad at light, night, you just move your tent over there, <laughs> right? But now Joe's goat keeps eating your whatever, leeks. Now it's a problem when you're permanent residents, right? But your interdependent goes in there. And you're immersed in a hostile culture, but you're expected to help heal it. Okay? See, out in the wilderness, you weren't really trying to change anything out there in the wilderness. You're just wandering around. Now it gets serious. You cross over that Jordan and something more goes. You're supposed to help redeem the land, restore the land that has been shed, has been shredded by bloodshed. You understand so far? So the overall idea is just go deeper, deeper still. And a lot of times we're just not all that cool with it. So the question is this, what are you still packing from last season? If I'm right, and this first thing is really about leaving, okay? Yes, we remember. Yes, we honor, but we fully engage. God, what do I need to leave? Now, it's not, not just leaving the stuff that's from Egypt, but it's also the stuff from the wilderness. There's two crossings, okay? Most of the time we want to do a jailbreak, but a lot of times we really don't want to invade turf and be responsible for it, okay? It's much easier to stay around out in the wilderness and just wander around. You, you do get, that's where most of the church has gotten. We believe that the end of the game is sort of salvation. Well, you're saved, great. Try not to blow yourself up until he comes. Better yet, try not to blow other people up. Right? And it's just, uh, that's it? That's it? And he says, no, I've got, I've got another crossing for you to take. Okay, some of you have baggage like this. How many have baggage like this? We have three up there. You have three? You have, oh, you have three in your pack. Okay, and they're still packed. So what are the things you need to unpack? What are the things of the past? See, when you get married, everything will come up from old memories of old boyfriends and girlfriends to patterns from mom and dad that you saw and everything else. That's all old stuff that you need to leave. And if it starts to encroach in your current, you've got to deal with it again, right? But then this other one is, that's just key to me is about, oops, it's about that wilderness part. That really gets me. What's still lingering from the wilderness? Because see, when they cross, one of the things that changes now is the pillar's no longer with them. They're expected to grow up and take dominion over the land. Well, we just want this clear manifestation like you did out there. I am with you, and we're going to get it done, right? You see that in Jericho and everything else, but it's going to be different. Don't be pining for the way it was. Be looking for how it needs to be next. Okay? We remember, we honor, but we fully engage because it's about the future and what's going to happen. Okay. And let me just warn you about this. The Lord would say, I committed to your freedom regardless of what it cost me. Amen? Yes? I didn't hear a very loud amen. So here's the other side. I'm committed to your freedom regardless of what it costs you. Do you understand? The one who gave it all is now looking for a response. So when that's the reality, regardless of what it costs you, then he's going to go to war against the things that hold us in bondage, whether it's hold us in bondage in the Egypt or hold us in bondage in the wilderness. This is one of the basic quotes that we have all the time. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Therefore, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery written to Christians. Clearly, there's always a danger of us reverting, right? As we saw with Israel. Oh, back in Egypt. You don't think that there were times when they were in the promised land that they're going, oh, 
Remember the manna I just showed up? Remember the pillar and the fire? And the, only three battles in 40 years. <sighs> okay? So be careful. It's just... Remember that each plague targeted a specific God that Egypt honored and in which Israel was immersed. Ba-boom. Ba-boom. God said, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. The Lord also executed judgments on their gods. So, what are the gods, idols in our culture that God is warring against and how have they been plagued? You see, God will go after the stuff that's holding us back from crossing, whether it's crossing into the wilderness or crossing into the promise. Personal idols, idols in our personal cultures. You, you get this? Okay. <clears throat> By the way, there are all sorts of things shaking going on, right? You think he's not dealing with stuff even here in the nation? Appearances, identities, things are getting challenged, sometimes personal, health challenges, relationships shift, change, they're lost or dead. We're, our level of comfort with a culture changing, isn't that being challenged? Some of you grew up in a time when your comfort with the culture was greater than it is now. Okay, All that stuff starts to shake. Confidence in various institutions, betrayals being let down by people, situations, God not doing things as we thought he would. Here's the big one. Oh, but God, I thought. Talking with a friend earlier, one of my favorite scenes out of the movie uh, City Slickers. How many of you seen that? Only a few. Okay. He's a city slicker, right? And he goes on kind of a dude ranch. They're supposed to be there as part of a, a cow drive. And in the midst of that, you know, because of all these pictures about the riding the horses and doing this stuff. And in the midst of that, he gets with this one old season. This guy looks like he's wearing, he's a saddlebag with eyes is his face, okay? <laughs> and they're out there and they, there's a, a cow that has to give birth. And so the old cowboy's holding the head. He says, okay, you got to reach in there and bring her out. He's going, reach in where? <laughs> he says, come on, just do it. And so he's, he's like, oh, you know, He's doing that, you know, and, and he's, he's, he's going, you know, he pulls his hand and goes, this was not in the brochure. <laughs> and when he does this, this stuff flies off his finger. It's just, it's a great scene. And the reason I remember it so is because I feel like I could do that to God regularly. This was not in the brochure. <laughs> this is not the way I thought it was going to be, right? Okay. That shakes us. Okay. And then when promises are delayed or hope is deferred, all that stuff shifts around. But I want to tell you this, too many can get to a place of crossing over, but never walk into the water. Okay? There's always a risk factor. And when you're looking at the Jordan part of it, the feet have got to go in first. The Red Sea part we kind of like, because you know, once the way was clear, we got in. With the Jordan, uh-uh, got to get in the water. And then it clears. But here's the reality. But these same people sure do seem to pray about it a lot. <laughs> With their back to the water. Did they pray, for uh, pray, pray for it? Yeah. Revo let it come, God, let it come. Okay, turn around and start it. Okay. But again, the call is always deeper, deeper still. Will we walk in? Will we go forward? And you know, you got to be aware that as you're moving in, there will always come this. You have a collect call from Egypt. <laughs> yeah? Wanting to know if you've had enough of this so-called freedom. Right? Didn't take long for that call to go to Israel, right? Not long at all. Three days. Oh, did you bring us out here so we die of thirst? Okay. Sound like anybody we know? And basically, it's your old bondage hopes you'll come back. Okay? But the reality is, we're always being called deeper, deeper still. But sometimes it'll feel like this. Okay, God, I'm celebrating. I'm deeper. I may be drowning. Sometimes it feels like that, right? 
the only way to cross sometimes you have to get in and then let see what he will do and then of course the wilderness wandering often is calling you to on your cell phone it'll find you wherever you are <laughs> and it's the same kind of thing it wants to know if you're tired of fighting and the responsibility to take possession of the land by the way your old trailers available <laughs> Come on back out here and just wander. None of you have ever felt the temptation or the desire to just go back out there. Let me tell you. There's days in the midst of the warfare. It's like, oh, Lord. But here we are. We're to take the land. The land, the land, the land. And each time we're being called to deeper, deeper still. Are you getting? This is a process. I mean, if you want to go to an Easter service, fine, but make sure it's about the resurrection. But don't just remember, don't just honor, engage. Okay, God, what in me now are you moving over? The life and death and resurrection of Jesus was to not only purchase my salvation, but then to break me from the wilderness into the next level, into the promise, and to secure it, not just for me, but then for a legacy and inheritance for children's children. So, this woman again, never met her, but I love that thing. I've had five marriages, but they've all been to the same man. Be okay with the fact. Allow the Lord to shift your relationship with him. Okay? Allow him to shift it. That was then, this is now. You're not in Egypt anymore, and you're not in the wilderness anymore, and your relationship with God changes in each place. In fact, as you're going about the promises and the territory, he will show himself mighty in different ways in different times. Don't look back to what he did in Egypt. Don't look back to what he did in the wilderness other than to thank him for that. Boy, God, you've been faithful, and I'm just, I'm going to be stunned to see how you do it here. Because let me tell you, there was no Jericho wall either in Egypt nor in the wilderness, but he did it there. Okay? We got to give him room to move into the next level with us, shift us, change us, so we're not again having the four best years of our life in second grade. Is this preparing you now for whatever else you do? Okay? I mean, this is a church. But a lot of you will go to another church and, and they'll do it differently. <laughs> Which is great. And you know what? If you want to drop eggs from a helicopter, as long as you don't throw them at my house on the way by, I'm okay with that. No, I'm serious. I don't, I, part of them is like, okay. I mean, if that gets people in who've never heard the gospel, and you can do it. But I'll tell you, the question is not what drops from the helicopter. It's how are the people there that are identifying themselves as active members or participants in that body, are they alive? Are they taking dominion over the land? Are they drawing people in? Are they fighting for their freedom? Am I being drawn then to that? Or does it just go like, okay, it's another social club. I'm sure that's fine, but you pay dues, you get benefits, you know each other. Okay, you, you wear you wear a little bumper sticker. You get you know, but it's like I don't see a change in the world. You know what what's going deeper, deeper still. Yeah? yeah. Okay. So let me pray for Revelation because if this time, if I'm right, if that little analogy God gave me years ago about leave, cleave, become one, it's a matter of identifying the stuff that you don't even know has still got you. How many of you know something that does have you, whether in the wilderness or in Egypt kind of thing that's holding you back? Yeah? Okay. That's a start. The reality is it's most of what we don't know that really is working. Okay? And so we've got to ask for exposure. Father, I thank you that your heart in all of this is that we move in the fullness of what you purchased. Lord, I love that line I read this week. Jesus didn't die just to keep us in line. He died to set us free and then so we would move into the full promise of thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
in this earth, in me, and out through me, around me, kingdom advancing. Father, I pray now that there any, the old parts, the old life of Egypt, the sin that so easily entraps, the collect calls that we're still taking, the conversations we're still having with the stuff of Egypt, Lord, that you would expose that. Never is it ever to shame us, but so we will see it and release it. And Father, whatever there is of the wilderness season, we wandered around that mountain long enough. It's time we get full bearing and advance to take the land you promised us. Whatever that means, Lord, show us places we're still seduced by the freedom of the wilderness, frankly, God. And sometimes that's more attractive than the new freedom we'll find in the promise. Make that clear and make any of those calls we're getting from the wilderness that are drawing us back, expose those now. And then, Father, as we see those, show us any demonic spirit or presence that is entwined around that, using it as a hook, that we will deal with that by the authority of the blood and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, we just look that this season, as we enter into the triumphal entry, that day when the lambs were selected for Passover, as we enter into Passover, as we enter into a memory of, of the night, of Jesus being betrayed, of his crucifixion, of his death and burial, and of the long waiting, but then of his resurrection, Lord, that this is all a transaction to take us deeper, deeper still. May that be true for each of us. By the Spirit, by the blood of the Lamb, so shall it be done. Amen.